doesn't feel like a, a, a victorious or, or winning position as they continuously try to hype up and, and build all of this enthusiasm around unity and uh, defending democracy. But it, it has felt like for quite some time that uh, this conflict, and when you even hear things like, all right, we're not so worried about Russia attacking Ukraine with nuclear strikes. That I mean, I remember when that was a huge point of conversation. It was right around, actually, I believe, these peace talks that were then leaked out as being disrupted. But it was right around, I feel like it was right around this April period, May period. And there's all these talks about, well, Russia could use tactical nuclear weapons. And it, was, it went through all the tabloid Western media and went through the entire Western corporate media apparatus. And it's almost like now they're admitting that they were just not telling the truth in the first place because now they want to do something different. Now, now they want to step up and escalate. And uh, so they, they, so they need to kind of roll back the narrative. I feel like that's been a common, a common theme here. Yeah. Well, they, they, they do, they paint themselves into the corner with their narratives and then they just walk across the wet paint and, you know, they don't care. And, and because they've done this so much, I think it has undermined their credibility, even among Western audiences that aren't really, awake. I think there's just the fact that they continuously do this is starting to uh, alert even people who are not really paying attention. Uh, I mean, they, they were accusing Russia of talking about using nuclear weapons when Russia did nothing of the sort. And just like you say, now, now that they want to dismiss any possibility of a, a nuclear escalation because they want to flood all of these weapons into Ukraine, now they pretend like it's not an issue. How do they know it's not an issue? Uh, they claimed that Putin was talking about nuclear weapons. When did he stop talking about them? When did he when did he go back on this position that he never actually really had? But you know, the New York Times never explains that. But this is what they do. They change with the wind. They did this all during Syria, and, and now they're doing it during Ukraine. And I, I think it's extremely I think it's extremely dangerous because I don't think they know which direction they actually need to go at this point. Hmm. Yeah. And I, I've been following your videos and I've been reading some of the same articles in the Western media and even Russian media now is saying, um, I haven't heard this necessarily from, you know, Vladimir Putin or Sergey Lavrov, but in, in certain art, you know, you can read analyses and RT and other places Saying that 2023 is a decisive year for this conflict, and the Western me mainstream media says this quite a lot. Actually, it's 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 something that m many Pentagon officials, the Biden administration, they're also saying. Stoltenberg is saying they're all saying it, kind of in line. What exactly is decisive about this year? Do you think it, is this a, a tacit admission that there's going to be a conclusion to this within the year, or? Is this something else that, that we should be thinking about? What, what do you think about this narrative of this being a decisive year for this conflict? I, I think it's kind of projection, actually. I think uh, in the halls of Western power, it's a decisive year because they need to make a decision. And whatever their decision is, it's either going to escalate this into uncharted territory or it's going to end in their defeat. That That is the decision that they are faced with. Sending all of these weapons is not going to change anything on the battlefield. The only thing that could potentially change anything is if they intervened directly. And it could manifest in many different ways. Uh, I, have, I have warned since this began that the West would be very tempted to create a, a buffer zone in Western Ukraine, possibly even including Odessa uh, on the coast to make sure that whatever is left of Ukraine at the end of all of this has, still has access to the sea. Uh, but it could be even more than that. We don't know. We don't know what they're, they, that's what they have to decide. That's what makes 2023 decisive because otherwise they could probably keep an armed conflict going for quite a while. Uh, but you're going to watch Ukrainian military, the Ukrainian government, Ukrainian society continuously deteriorate throughout this. So the it'll become increasingly obvious that there is no light at the end of the tunnel for them. They are done. They're just fighting on, just like just like the militants in Syria. They continue fighting on. There's zero chance of them 
overthrowing the Syrian government at this point. But they, you know, that this is what the U.S. wants. They want to prolong it for as long as possible. Uh, if they cannot win, they want to try to just burn everything down in the process. And I, and I think they're going to have a similar approach regarding Ukraine. And I think, yes, decisive because they have to decide: do they do they want to intervene? How will they intervene? And if not, how are they going to deal with defeat? Mm. Yeah, and, and at the same time that this is happening, at the same time that there's all these calculations, whether it's the weapons. How much do we send? When do we send them? How do we get them operable as soon as possible or operational operational as soon as possible? It, it, as there's this seeming anxiety and projection, as you say, coming from the collective West, from NATO, from the U.S. At the same time, what I noticed, what I thought was kind of stunning, actually, was it almost seemed like you had a, large, a, a significant section of the foreign policy establishment in the United States in particular, shifting their attention pretty intensely to Taiwan and China in a way that was, it felt it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily coordinated, but it almost felt like there was some kind of uh, almost shift in direction. There was some kind of, there was, maybe it was an order from high up or something that got all of these, especially the think tanks, but you even had, James Bierman, a top general in Japan, uh, do an interview for the Financial Times and say, we're setting the theater for war with China and Asia. Everything we've been doing, especially our increased relations and our ability to coordinate militarily with a now uh, a highly militarized Japan, given its uh, doubling of its military budget this year. Um you know, you had that. You had the uh, Center for Strategic International Studies, a, a U.S. government <laughs> contractor, weapons contractor funded think tank, do a war simulation around this. This is all happening from January 3rd to uh, the, the, a week or two afterward. And then you had also Foreign Policy Magazine, of course, uh, one of the top magazines of the neocon imperial establishment. They had a huge, they had David Petraeus. They had Anders Fogh Rasmussen, the NATO, for NATO Secretary General, former NATO Secretary General. You, you know, you had all these war criminals come together and say, here's the lessons we need to learn from Ukraine in order to wage war on Taiwan uh, or wage war with China over Taiwan. And so, <laughs> you know, I, I, I guess I, I'm wondering what your reaction to this is, given all the circumstances that you've just laid out with Ukraine, that the situation is not necessarily going exactly in the favor of nato the collective west and of course their master the united states i mean they're talking about learning lessons from ukraine so that they can better go wage war against china uh through taiwan because taiwan is their proxy of choice uh, and and japan is playing the part of maybe poland and germany combined and and, and really what they should be doing is learning the lessons of why they should not even be thinking about doing this in Asia, what they're doing in Eastern Europe. Uh, but they're not going to learn that lesson because they, they have been obsessed for generations uh, with subordinating China. They had at one point been in the process of subordinating China. Uh, people just look back to the century of humiliation that, that China went through. Uh, and they are obsessed with the idea of reasserting themselves over China and Asia the idea of American primacy over Asia, which, I mean, it is a region of the planet the U.S. is not even located in, and yet they they presume primacy over it. And so this concept is not easy for them to let go. They cannot like, let it go, just like they cannot let go the, the idea of allowing Russia to be a strong nation with an independent foreign policy, just like they can't let go of the idea of Germany having its own independent foreign policy and working together with Russia, but also still working together with the United States, they find all of this incredibly unacceptable. So as long as they find that unacceptable and they cannot imagine a world where the U.S. is um, among other nations rather than imposing itself upon all other nations, they're going to go down the same exact track. They're going to do the exact same thing in Asia that they've just done in, in Ukraine, and they're going to find themselves painted into the same corner. And Japan is going to suffer tremendously. They're, they're already uh, have all kinds of problems, domestic problems that they need to be addressing. And instead, their government 
Well, just think about it. Before, before the special military operation, it really looked like Germany and Russia working together with the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, uh, all of the trade, all of the energy, everything. It seemed impossible for Germany to have done the things that it has now done. But this is what the U.S. does. They maneuver client regimes into power that are going to make decisions that uh, suit the United States at the, at the expense of the people in that actual country that the client regime is, is uh, operating in. And so they're going to do the exact same thing in Japan. J J Japan's largest trade partner is China. Uh, uh, the largest trade partner for everyone in Asia is China, more or less, uh, with very few exceptions. And so Japan, uh, trying to confront its largest trade partner, they're going to they're going to create a self-inflicted wound that they're not going to recover from, just like Germany is. And Germany uh, is cutting off Russia. They're you know they're being you know I I I don't know how unwillingly they're being strong armed into going along with the, the proxy war in Ukraine, but they are, and their industry is going to be gutted, and then they're not going to recover from it. And it didn't have to be that way. And the same goes for Japan. And so we, we just have to wait and see. Hopefully things, I mean, the reason they're talking about this, Danny, you're pointing out how ridiculous it is that they're in the middle of this, this, uh, this complete disaster in Ukraine. And they're, they're, now they're talking about picking a fight with China at the exact same time. Uh, it's insane. But the reason they're doing it is because they are completely out of time. There is no time for them to finish Ukraine and then move on to China. The window of opportunity for the U.S. to assert itself globally in their mind, that is closing. I think it already has closed, but they see it as closing. They still have a, a, an opportunity where they could try something. So they're going to do it, whether it seems plausible or not. They feel like uh, at, at least give it a try. And so that, that's where we are right now. Hmm. Very, very dangerous times. It, it it is very dangerous, and it's it's absurdly dangerous, as as you note. This article, I, I believe, in the Foreign Policy Magazine was written. It was either January third or published January third or January fifth. Not, I mean, of course, we've had Solidar. We had some things change in, in the Ukra Ukraine conflict scenario. But if you read this article, what's striking is the the amount of just heavy layered. Uh, propaganda, war propaganda, telling us that Russia actually has done very poorly here. They they were the ones who overestimated so much pro projection. I think they were the ones who overestimated. Uh, there are so many lessons that we can learn positively. So that's what's very ironic about this too. That they are saying that the Ukraine situation is a positive uh, 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 development that allows them to glean positive lessons for the next war. And what's so striking about that is that after all these things we talked about with Ukraine's problems, using this weaponry, being struck down, ha having to replace them very quickly, depleting stockpiles. In Taiwan, I believe there is kind of a, a, a um, you have to serve in the military, you have to serve in what military exists there. I think for something like a month, right? Everyone has to do for some, something like a month, all, all uh, military the age demographics have to do that for a month. Taiwan, if we think that that Ukraine is having issues with the the military side of this, being able to handle these weapons, tai, Taiwan is awash. They call it making it a porcupine. That's what the foreign policy establishment says. They've never ever they haven't used any of these things in any real combat situation, nor. Ha nor do I think most people on that island would ever really think such a thing was uh, was a good idea. So, so it just seems to me so absurd to look at Taiwan as this panacea for the next war when the situation seems more dire there uh, in terms of prospects than even what's happening in Ukraine. You're absolutely right. And there was a, a local election not that long ago. And the Democratic Progressive Party fared very badly. And that was because, uh, and, and uh, Tsai Ing-wen, the, the, the current president of Taiwan, uh, she even said it was, uh, you know, it was like a referendum on her, all of her rhetoric about t Taiwan being independent, being anti-mainland, you know, being anti the rest of China because they are part of China. 
uh, and even she recognized it. And so that that is the mood in Taiwan versus you know the mood in Ukraine where you you have at least a part a significant part of the segment of the population that is extremely uh, anti-Russian and extremist right. uh, and militant. You don't you don't have this demographic in Taiwan. Also, Taiwan, I don't know if people know this, but it's an island. So you're not going to be shipping weapons into right. Taiwan in the middle of any possible conflict. But the thing that, the thing that worries me is that we already see the U.S. moving uh, chip production out of Taiwan, or at least, yeah. you know, trying to get the most valuable parts of that, put it in Arizona, whether it's going to work or not, I, 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 I doubt it, but that's what they're doing. And what do you, I mean, why would you be doing that? If you're, if your idea is to protect Taiwan and then make it independent, give it this bright future, why would you be doing that? What they're mm -hmm. actually doing is preparing to blow the whole thing up. They want to create the, the biggest, nastiest, most costly conflict possible for China to just set China back, whether they win or lose. I mean, they know they're going to lose, but they just want to try to create a, as catastrophic a wound geopolitically for China as possible to uh, force it to lose face on the global stage, depict it as, as uh, aggressive, as violent, as much death and destruction, the same process that they're they're going through with Ukraine and, and smearing and undermining Russia's position on the global stage. And so this is where they are right now. It's, it's uh, you know, you're, you're doing scorched earth as you retreat. So that the American empire is retreating and they're resorting to scorched earth and they're just destroying everything. So I think everything from Crimea to Taiwan and everything in between is at risk because of this dangerous mentality. And I think unfortunately, there are a lot of world leaders and, and governments that are well aware of this and are trying to get ahead of it. And I think there's others who unfortunately are, are ill-informed and they go along with whatever the Western media says and they're unprepared for it. Yeah, in my estimation too, when we see the strategy, when we see the U.S.'s geopolitical ambitions, imperial ambitions seem to falter, and yet we hear the cacophony and the rhetoric intensify. I think there's both, of course, maybe anxiety producing uh, more intense escalations, but also the fact that if you just look at any of these sources that are promoting this, that are pushing this, we see that there are big economic players, especially the military contractors, that are bankrolling much of the strategic arm, the the theoretical arm of of the U.S.'s military plans and goals. Uh, whether through these think tanks, the New York Times can't stop citing think tanks like the Center for Strategic International Studies, and in this foreign policy article, that's all you really got. You you got a bunch of either former. Uh, war criminals like David Petraeus or, or current war criminals, David Petraeus, or you have these fellows from places like the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Literally the biggest funders are Northrop Grumman and, and the biggest military contractors. So obviously a lot of this also is to generate and fuel the arms industry and to give them what they want. But maybe now is a good time to get into some questions um, to, to close the program. Um, and I'll try to ask as many before uh, uh, you are completely exhausted. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a few, we don't have too many at the moment, but you know, for those who have uh, any kind of questions, you can leave a super chat, uh, sign up on YouTube or sign up on Patreon. Um, but one of the ones that I saw early, let me just, um, pull it up here uh, they say what is the possibility of nato or western forces occupying some part of ukraine yamlak thanks for the super chat what do you think brian in my estimation i this is something that i've been warning about since this, this began i could very easily see them attempt to establish some sort of buffer zone in western ukraine including odessa so they they maintain access to the to the sea i i could easily see them do that and then try to uh, expand from there. You know, if you took over Western Ukraine, you know, NATO forces were in Western Ukraine, it would create a sort of no-fly zone, no-go zone, just like in Syria, 
uh, Eastern Syria is kind of a, a no-go zone for Rus Russia and their proxies. So they would try to create something similar. And then that would reduce, because right now, every time something that Ukraine is using breaks down, say in Bakhmut, they have to send it a thousand kilometers to the border with Poland to get it repaired, and then a thousand kilometers back. Now, the, the real question is, if they tried to set up some kind of uh, buffer zone in Ukraine, and what happens if Russia fires cruise missiles into that buffer zone to destroy maintenance facilities and other things they try to do to shorten the logistic lines? I don't know. That's scary. That's a scary prospect. Sure. Yeah. Well, we have another question here. Thank you, Matless X. Uh, can you explain, Brian, the reasons why Russia would have ordered the French ministerial vessels, ministerial vessels that ended up sanctioned when it seems that Russia's military complex could have produced these items? I'm not sure about that one. What, are, what is your yeah. take, Brian? I mean, obviously, with effort, Russia could produce their own amphibious assault ships. They can. But uh, it's part France already has. A deal like this could help cement a relationship between Russia and France and thus uh, the rest of Europe, just like they were doing with Nord Stream 2. This was all about, I mean, it was always on Russia's side. It was always good faith. They were always uh, doing deals with Europe that they didn't actually really need to do. I, I think as this this viewer is pointing out, they didn't really need to do this because now that the this program was canceled, Russia is developing their own amphibious assault ships. So, I mean, this was always about trying to create connections between Russia and Europe to make sure that conflict was was never a prospect and and the US thoroughly sabotaged sabotaged it and all of the proxies the u.s has helped maneuver into power in in the capitals across europe and in the european union in brussels they have ensured that this this did not happen and who is paying the price for it it's russia to a certain degree but mostly europe now is paying the price uh, in terms of energy and in terms of all of these deals of that that are now gone